Welcome into our special EP snack today with our wonderful Regina Kiefer, who's here representing now Chart Healthcare Academy, but she's agreed to come on today and talk to us about pacemakers and their modes. So I'm super excited to introduce to you, if you have not met her before, Regina. So Regina, take it away. Tell us all, all the things. <laughs> all the things. Hey, everybody. How are you? I am really glad to be here with y'all. Let's talk about pacemakers. Um, if you don't know me, conduction, EKG, these are all my favorite things. EP, EP Lab, I've worked for 15 years and I love it. I'm in education now full time, but I miss it. So anytime I can talk about conduction, I'm on it. So let's just review. you got the SA node. This is where we want all our conduction to start from. We want it to go through the atrium, hit that AV node, and then that should be the only connection between the atrium and the ventricles, his bundle here, and then split into your two bundle branches. I don't know what else y'all have been talking about as far as conduction, but I'm sure you've been through all of that. So just a quick reminder there. People who need pacemakers are going to have some kind of a bradycardia, some kind of a pacing indication. That could be due to, due to a sick sinus node syndrome. It could be due to some other um, infarct in which artery, which artery controls that area? The right coronary artery. I'm sure y'all have been talking about that a lot, yeah. right? That's so one of our favorite real things. Real busted that. She did? <laughs> busted that. Yes, she did. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so damage to the right coronary artery frequently damages those nodes and their blood flow. So this is just an overview of what the pacemaker looks like going in. We scrub the chest, we access the subclavian vein, and the left side is the preferred side because that's usually the non-dominant side two different leads. Um, pacemakers, I'll tell you, can have one lead or two leads, but in this, in the picture we have two. So coming down, we have, um, let me just draw real quick, in yellow. Whoops, I messed up. That's okay, we can go back. Perfect, right, guys. That's what I got, I'm trying to be fancy. <laughs> Jeez, there we go. Let's go back. There. So one lead goes and lands in the atrium. That's going to pump your atrial, give that atrial kick back to your patient. The second lead goes through that tricuspid valve and into the right ventricular apex. Got to be careful there because that apex is thin. The right ventricle, even though it's thicker than the atrium, is still pretty thin. And those pacemaker leads can be kind of pointy on the end. So if you get into the, into some of that trabeculated tissue, you can end up going through that tissue. Got to be super careful. Any questions about location here? So I know there's two types of attachments for pacemaker wires. There's the screw and then there's sort of the, <laughs> the tying leads. The tined leads. Mm -hmm. So what is more common? The screw in leads are more common now because you can, you can screw them in and you can unscrew them. So if you have the tined leads, they kind of go in and then they splay out into the tissue and then they're embedded for basically ever. So they are much more difficult if you need to reposition, if you need to take that lead out for any reason. Mm -hmm. Most common reason to need to remove one is infection, vegetation has grown attached to the lead and, and those kinds of things. So timed leads are very, very difficult to get out. If you have to remove a timed lead, usually that's an OR procedure and we use a laser and, and all kinds of things. It can't even be an operative procedure. So we like the screw in leads, we screw it in, it just unspirals out the end of the lead and into the tissue, it still becomes embedded. But nine times out of 10, we can still unscrew it, move our lead around and then screw it back in. What, how long do patients, um, because of that whole tined or, and or screwed in lead, how long do they have to keep their arm immobilized usually? It's, some doctors don't even have them stay immobilized at all. Some doctors don't send them home with the sling or anything, but uh, usually for a, a regular pacemaker, not a BIV pacemaker, different situation with that because with the BIV pacemaker, you're not able to screw in that lead. It's just sitting in a vein on the back side of the heart. But yeah. a day or two, most people would say a day or two. Now they wouldn't have you out doing any heavy work. They wouldn't have you vacuuming. They wouldn't have you driving, anything like, um, a lot of people want to swim and they want to golf and we're like no you can't do that give yourself a good two weeks on that but in general you know one or two days for normal activity 
Awesome. And then um, how are they closing the pacemaker pockets these days? Are they doing Dermabond? Are they doing glue? We have, uh, seen, we have seen the gamut. So dependent, completely physician dependent. We have um, Dermabond. We have, uh, what was the other one? Skinafix. Mm -hmm. Like that. And then uh, we had one surgeon or one EP doc who liked to staple. He found that that was more, um, he got better results with staples. So sutures, um, steri strips, definitely, and um, and even staples. Is any, I don't know if any y'all see anything different in your areas. No, that's exactly what we see too. But yeah, our every doctor closes differently. <laughs> that makes it challenging. Yeah, yeah. Everybody has their own thing for their own reasons. It's really pretty cool. Um, anything else on while well, I have the picture of the pacemaker and how it goes into the body? Yeah, I think a lot of people, um, you know, would want to know, you know, um, do patients need to be sedated for this procedure oh, and gotcha. do they, do they actually, when they go in, how big is the puncture site mm -hmm. and, um, you know, how big is the pocket that they make? Um, those kind of questions. I know people always ask that. Okay. I have, um, I wish I had a pacemaker with me, um, but your pacemaker is going to be about this big. They are pretty, pretty small now. It's about this big in height, and they're about mm, that thin. They're pretty thin if it's just a pacemaker. Now, for a defibrillator, it's gonna be thicker. So what we do is we make a small incision uh, about an inch, okay. maybe an inch and a half, in the subclavian region here under, let me go to my left shoulder, right under that, uh, right under that clavicle, and we go in with the Seldinger technique. So Seldinger technique is where you take a hollow needle, you access the vein through it. You can tell when you're in the vein because you get dark blood return. It kind of puddles out. And then we slide a wire through that. In my picture here, you can see, this is where the puncture was. We slide a wire through that hollow needle, take the hollow needle off, and then you're able to advance the sheath and then the lead through the sheath. I, we have a question here actually from Denise. Uh, she works in the hospital. She says, is typical wound check usually within a week? And also limited activity you are saying is doctor specific? I came in on the end of the statements, I think. Oh. Yes, our doctors, my, my doctors did different things. So some people would have them a, a day or two. Some doctors did not use a sling. Usually post-op was a week to two weeks. I, it, it was really a week if they were going to just see the nurse practitioner, but most of the time the EP docs could not get people back in that quickly. So then it would be a two week follow up. Wound care, super important on that. Yeah, super important. Um, and then people always ask, when can I shower? <laughs> <laughs> in a couple of hours. <laughs> we would rather you not get that site wet until after the stair, if you have stereo strips until after they come off, you know, water, um, Believe it or not, and maybe, anyways, water is a really big carrier of germs. So you don't want any regular water from a sink getting in your wound. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's fine to drink it, but you don't want it in your wound. Um, so you want to make sure that skin is pretty well healed over before you start showering and getting it actually saturated and wet. Okay. That's awesome. I love it. Great. So um, that's how we access the vein. And then everything is done through that area. The only, the incision that we put in is just above the muscle layer and in the subcutaneous tissues. Oh, I know one other question that uh, someone had was when you put the wire, the um, RV wire through that mm -hmm. valve, does it create some mitral regurge after that? Oh, it, not, not, not much. Not much. Now we sometimes have to fight people who already have mitral regurge and getting the valve to um, open enough and let it let us get through it to even yeah. place that lead. So that can be a challenge sometimes, but it doesn't cause a lot of regurge. It really kind of becomes part of that tissue. It's going to endothelialize inside. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. What you can have if you have a pacemaker in and your patient is pacing a lot, if they have a high pace burden, yeah. um, you can induce congestive heart failure. Yeah, we've seen that. And so that a lot. Um, that's why we want to decrease RV or be, be pacing as much as we can. So we, we don't have that. Yeah, we've, we've seen that. So what, what is the percentage um, for that you'll normally tip the scales with that? Like, is it 49% RV pacing or is there a number that you know of? 
There's, um, gosh, I wouldn't want to say probably different doctors have different ideas, but anybody who's pacing more than 60%, they're going to really consider whether they should go ahead and do a bi with that or yeah. if they should plan to upgrade in the future if, if there's no other indicators. They, it's such a fine line, as you know, with yeah. uh, what, what insurance will let you do. So, yep, amen to that. <laughs> yeah. That is true. Uh, I know. I mean, we just have to fight. I can get everything. It is. It's true. Thankfully, right. most. Of, oh, go ahead. What you got? No, you 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 go ahead. Um, because we were super curious to see what else you have. I know a lot of people are very excited about your um your modes because that's always a good refresher. Yes, the modes are going to be very very interesting. I just wanted to show you quickly. Oops. Oh, dang it. <laughs> I wanted to show you quickly here in this picture the ends. So this is what your standard device look like. looks like. I don't work for St. Jude. They all look like this though. They all look like this. And your two different leads would attach into these little circles right here. So you call that the header, the entire metal part, that's the can and that's the battery. So if you have to change a battery, you're changing out the whole device. You're not taking that piece of metal apart. It's the whole device. And they usually last around like 10 years, depending on how much you use it. And then the great thing is that um, you get an upgrade in your uh, technology. Yes. When By you... the time you come back, you there's definitely been some upgrades in the technology. It goes so fast. What that means is this is the standard, the industry standards for how we're going to all program these pacemakers across the globe. Um, we want them to be the same so that if you have your pacemaker put in in America and you go to England, you're gonna people are gonna understand what your programming is. It needs to be the same. So electrophysiology works as a global industry. Um, the way the codes work are there's, you can have up to five letters. There'll be letters in a row. The first letter is indica indicates which chamber is paced. <laughs> yeah, I thought, wow, that's a lot of hardware, but they're, they're I mean, they're tiny. Yeah, but still, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Thanks for sharing all these amazing pearls, Regina, and, and your time. <laughs> Um, where can people where can people find out more about um, EP for allied professionals? Well, I'm going to send you to my site. <laughs> um, I work for Chart Healthcare Academy, and we have an entire EP program. We do professional development. Right now, it's focused primarily on the EP industry, so devices and EP mapping. Um, procedures, studies, all that kind of stuff as well. So our website is charthealthcareacademy.com. And I'd love to have you guys stop by and put any questions in the on the website. I usually answer questions two or three times a day, and I would love to hear from y'all. And you have a course coming up uh, in December. Oh my gosh, in December, yes. And Jen's going to help us. What, what? She's going to come and present. Yes, I'm going to do EKGs on Thursday. Yes. But your your whole it's like three day experience for people, uh -huh. right? Right, and we're we're this is our first time we're able to bring our usual EP content to the nurse practitioners and physician assistants specifically. So we are really excited. Um, several people in that category, the advanced practitioners category, and their physicians are like, "Hey, we want you to have something. You know, we like what you did for the allied health people, and that's great. But we want them. We want something that's more focused on their specific role." So we're developing new content for that. And our first course is going to be December 9th. So that'll be advertised pretty good. If you're interested in more EP content and you're an EP provider, we would love to have you come and um, participate in the course. It's a live virtual event. So it's just like what we're doing now. This is what I did all week long, actually. <laughs> and it was I know you're, pro you're probably burned out, but we're, <laughs> we're super happy you took the time to come. No, no, no. I love it. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's because, been so long since we've got to hang out with you. So we're, we're loving that you're coming back to us. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm trying so hard. Now that my, my life is settling down a little bit more and working for charts, so I have more of a, I was going to say I have a regular schedule, but I work from home, so I have an everything schedule. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's great. Oh, awesome. All right, Regina. Well, thank you for your time, and um, we appreciate you as always. And if anybody has any follow-up questions, um, please feel free to post them in this thread and I'm sure Regina will check them as well. And yes. we so appreciate you. So thank you again for coming. Oh, thank you. Y'all, y'all have a great evening. I'll talk to you soon, Jen. For sure, Regina. Okay. Bye guys. Bye.